privilege to be with you here today. And uh, as Karen mentioned, my name is Enoch Lavender, and I'm a pastor uh, based at a church called Living Way Christian Network. My wife, Sarah, and I head up a ministry called Shalom Israel, which uh, teaches churches about the Jewish background of our faith and also raises support for churches who are in Israel who are facing difficulties, who are reaching out in their communities. My wife uh, and I have 14-month-old twins, David and Hannah, and we're all sending greetings to you today. Our topic that I want to share on is called Goodness versus Happiness. Now, our world pursues happiness. Happy New Year, we say, as we enter 2021, and we hope it will be true. We say happy birthday, and we send wishes to everyone to be happy on their special day. I don't know if you, like me, have got some really strangely worded birthday cards at times. Those pre-written cards in the shop, they'll say, oh, I wish you happiness every day of your life, and you are absolutely amazing and wonderful. And as you read those words, they really don't mean much. But our world is pursuing happiness. Our world is pursuing joy. Happiness from shopping, happiness from relationships. And parents say, all I want is for my children to be happy. Doesn't matter what they do, doesn't matter where they go, may they just find happiness. This is how our world works and this is how our world talks. But let's have a look at a Hebraic understanding of true happiness that comes from God's goodness. Let's have a look at how our Heavenly Father wants to treat us as his children. We'll start by going back to Genesis. And we read in the beginning that everything God did was good. And as he created mankind, he said it was very good. So God's work is characterized by goodness, while our world is characterized by the pursuit of happiness. The rabbis have a bit to say about this, and they point out that what makes us happy isn't always good for us. Maybe you like your chocolates and your sweets like me, but it doesn't do you good in the long run. But what is good for us doesn't always make us happy there and then. We are teaching our twins to eat all kinds of food and sometimes they have a strange expression on their face as they try something new. It hasn't made them happy, but we know it is good for them. So God is a good God. And what he does in our lives isn't necessarily related to us being happy, but it is related to him showing his goodness and doing good for us. We wish people a happy marriage. And we have the fairy tale story of the young prince and a beautiful bride living happily ever after. But again, is this reality? For those of you who are married like myself, you'll know that while your wedding day hopefully was a really happy day, not every single day after that day is going to be fantastically happy. In fact, you might have times of frustration, times of tears, times of struggle, pressure all around you. It is not necessarily happiness every single day of your life. A biblical perspective on marriage is quite different. It says in Proverbs 18.22 that he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Now that's the King James translators who are translating this and they have added in the word thing right here. But if you look in the Hebrew, it actually says, he who finds a wife finds good. So ladies, you are not things. You are not objects. You are in fact good. That is the Bible's description of who you are and what you're meant to be towards your husband. Now good doesn't mean always happy. And it doesn't mean things are always easy. But it is always good. In a marriage relationship, we have the opportunity to learn to love when things are tough, to learn to forgive when people wrong us, to learn to be patient when the kids are up late at night and screaming, to learn to trust and accept someone who has a different perspective than yourself. This is why marriage is good in God's sight. It is good for us to learn these lessons. So perhaps a better wedding wish 
as you go to the next wedding you attend is simply found in Psalm 23 verse 6 that goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. That is God's plan for marriage and that is God's plan for those of you who are single as well. His goodness to be manifest in your life every day. I found online a very popular t-shirt and there's lots of different varieties of this design. It says, I love God, but some of his children get on my nerves. <laughs> it's a best-selling t-shirt and I, I think we know why, because many of us have problems with God's children. We love God, he is amazing, he is fantastic, but his children are not so well behaved at times. But God has ordained for us to be in relationship not just with him, but with our fellow man. Not just with him, but with believers. As we become believers, he places us in a body. He places us in a congregation. And he connects us with people who are different from us, who have different opinions than us, who say things differently, smell differently, look differently. And we need to learn to love those people. It's not easy, but it is good. God said in Genesis 2, 18, it is not good for man or for a person to be alone and I'll make him a companion. And while this is talking about marriage, it ultimately applies to all of us in our lives. God has placed you and I in families. And sometimes the most difficult relationships are those in our families. Husbands, wives, mothers-in-laws, fathers-in-laws, cousins, we wish not to see them sometimes. We don't want to talk to them. But God has put us in these families to learn to love nonetheless. Because that is what he does with us. He puts up with us. He puts up with our issues. And he loves us nonetheless. And he's calling us to walk in that love towards the people he's put around us. How else would we learn to forgive unless we had someone to forgive? How else would we learn to love unless someone was actually quite challenging to love. How else will we learn to be patient, unless we actually had some things to be patient about? Even pain itself can be good. Now what do I mean by that? Well, in the days of Jesus, uh, or Yeshua as we call him, a popular disease or spreading among many people was known as leprosy. And leprosy resulted in people losing fingers, losing limbs, but what was the cause of that? It was that they lost sensitivity. They couldn't feel the pain that was happening to their finger or their toe, and so damage was happening, and before they knew it, they had severely hurt their hand. Leprosy took away the pain that they felt, and more and more damage was happening. And in some ways, this is what the world wants when it is wishing happiness. It wants to take away the pain that people feel in everyday life. They hope they'll just have a big smile on their face. But that is not how our God operates. He has ordained and he has made us in such a way that we can feel pain, whether it is physical pain, emotional pain. Perhaps from our relationships, we're feeling pain in our hearts. The answer is not to drown the pain, or run away from the pain, but to take that pain to him. It is a symptom of something that needs dealing with. It shows us there's a problem. So if there's pain in our hearts, let's not deaden it. Let's not run away from it, but let's take that pain to our good God. The one who cares for us, who loves us and has the answer. And he will teach us and enable us to forgive, enable us to let go, and enable that pain to be taken away. Goodness and repentance. Romans 2.4 says that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Now that does not mean that God is going to be some kind of Santa Claus, showering lots of gifts upon us, and as a result we all just bow down and we repent from all our sins. Here in the Western world we have Santas in every shopping centre and supermarket, but I have yet to see anyone repent because they've seen Santa. That's not how God operates. It is his goodness that leads us to repentance, but it is his goodness that actually challenges our sin, that points out what needs changing and brings us to a place where we want to change. 
Some of the most difficult times in my life have been when I've been struggling with sin. But God has brought me to a point and challenged me to deal with it, not to sweep it under the carpet, not to hide it away, but in some cases seek prayer and say to someone, this is what's going on in my life. Can you please pray for me? And in those very moments when I've shed tears, when I have cried over what has been going on, I have seen God's goodness. And as I've come out the other end, I've felt so good. I've received his, his love, his compassion again. And I know I'm restored to him. It was his goodness that led me to repentance and his goodness that accepted me and loved me on the other side. And that is a story for all of us. Whether you've been a believer for many years or whether you are just new, coming to faith. At the very beginning of our walks, we very easily will repent and confess to God what we have done. But as time goes on, sometimes we neglect doing it. We allow it to build up. We allow things to be swept under the carpet. But it is his goodness that will even right now challenge you and I to deal with those issues, to deal with those sins, and know that he will accept us and bring us back to him. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. It says in Romans 8, 28. We know that when Abraham and Sarai had their encounter with God, when God did his work in their lives, he changed their names. And he added a letter He in the Hebrew to their names, changing them from Abram to Abraham, from Sarai to Sarah. And that letter He represents the breath and the presence of God. But what happens if we take the word for evil, which is ra, and you add the letter he to it? Interestingly enough, you get the word ra, which means to feed, means pasture, means sheep. In other words, as the presence of God is added into our difficult and evil world, into the challenging situations you and I face, it becomes a place where we receive food and strength and nourishment spiritually. God wants to take the very most difficult things you are facing and turn them into good in your life and turn them into something from which you and I can gain strength. Let's give thanks. The key scripture for today is found in Psalm 100, verse 4 to 5. It says that we are to enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courtyards with praise, give thanks to him and bless his name. Now why are we to give thanks to him? Why? Is it because our circumstances are perfect? Is it because he's done a miracle in our lives? Well, certainly that's a good time to praise him. But the psalmist gives us the reason in the next verse. He simply says, For Adonai is good. And I want you to remember this. When you face difficulties in your life, when your circumstances do not look good at all, remember that in the midst of it, God is good. He has not changed. He remains good. He remains faithful. And even there and even then you can give thanks to him. And as you do, you enter into his presence. You enter in to the place where you can receive the miracle and the breakthrough and the answers that you need. God is a good God. Psalm twenty-seven, thirteen says, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. God's goodness is not just reserved for eternity, for some time far away, but he wants to manifest and reveal it in our lives. And yes, there will be times when you go through a valley, times when you go through a challenge, times when things are really, really tough. But I want you to know that there's coming a day when it's going to turn around when you'll be able to look even at your circumstances and see how God has worked it for good and how now you are walking in his manifest goodness in your life. Many of us have been praying for Abby and family and it's so good to see what God is doing there, ch changing and turning around the situation. And I believe for her and others in the congregation that God wants to say that he will be revealing his goodness in their lives here on earth in an even greater way than we have seen. Psalm 23, 6, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life 
The world is pursuing happiness, but we are here to seek God because He is a good God. While our circumstances are not always easy, they are always for our good. And I believe we will see His goodness here on earth. Sarah and I have uh, written a book that is just about to be published where we share our story of having a promise from God where God spoke to us both about getting married and nothing seemed to be happening. In fact, I tried. I tried to make it work. I tried knocking on various doors, trying to connect with the young ladies I knew and I just faced a closed door. And time went by and years went on but God was at work in that time. He was at work in that journey. He was good in that journey because he was preparing me and preparing my wife-to-be so that when the time came that he led us together, we would be ready to face the challenges he had for us as a married couple. So if you are waiting for a promise from God, if you are seeking for a miracle from him, I'd like you to have a look at our book and gain encouragement in your own journey. It is available for pre-order on our website, pastorenoch.com.au slash pre-order. It will be available mid to late February. So before I end, I'd like to pray for you. So Father God, I just pray for your blessing upon each and every person who is listening right now. You know where they're at and the challenges that they have faced in their lives. And I thank you for your word of encouragement for them right now that you are faithful, that you are good, that you remain good and you're on the throne and that you're going to work out the challenges in their lives for their good and for your glory. And so we just pray for your blessing upon our congregation and everyone who is listening. And I thank you that you are a good God and we honour you today. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen.